you know, bit, building on the conversation of the last panel and talking about policies, we, we recognize that one of the real key uh, distinctions here among political parties and among political philosophies is what's the role of the market vis-a-vis -vis policy, right? So we wanted this panel to look specifically at how new companies, early stage companies, come to market. What are the, what's the role, what's the appropriate role of market intervention, of, of, I'm sorry, of policy intervention, of regulation, of a more activist approach to bringing technologies to the market to solve these large problems we've been talking about in the environmental world. And then conversely, what role does the market have to play? And uh, how much support, what types of incentives uh, do early stage companies really need? Or can the market just bring these technologies to bear um, themselves? So leading that conversation, um, Will be David Nash, who I introduced or mentioned earlier, is a partner with Mc with uh, Mc Mc McMahon McMahon de Gaulis, uh, based here in uh, Ohio in Cleveland, has a number of offices throughout the state, and Dave's been a really great stalwart partner in structuring uh, this overall program and putting this panel together. So let me turn it over to Dave uh, for next steps here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm very little challenge and I hate Hawkins. So I'm going to stand in front rather than behind it. Um, thank you for being here for the last presentation of the day. We really appreciate it. Um, the discussion of the first two panels has been great and laid wonderful groundwork for uh, our panel. What, what, who we are, we're the regional job creators um, for this program. And um, with me today we have Jim White, who is the Director of Sustainable Infrastructure for the Port of Cleveland, will talk about an exciting clean technology and beneficial use program, uh, which is a public-private partnership that has really worked. Next to Jim is Evie Holes from Splashlink, who uh, has started this company called Splashlink, that is a portal for clean water technology companies to support each other. EB is also part of the Clean Water Alliance here in Cleveland, which is an important sponsor of this program, and frankly, I think, provided lunch for us. We have the CEO of Clean Water Alliance here, Brian Stubbs, and we have the chairman of the board of Clean Water Alliance, Carol Crusoe. Thank you so much for your support of this program. The Clean Water Alliance is also uh, a very important regional and becoming a national player in bringing clean water stakeholders together for um, public-private partnerships and especially private sector solutions for water quality issues for the Great Lakes. Um, next to EB is Kathy Belt, the president of Jumpstart, which is our regional nonprofit venture capital firm here in the region. Um, Barb Ewan, Kathy's right, your left, is uh, the Chief Operating Officer of the Youngstown Business Incubator. And last but not least is one of my colleagues, friends, and mentors, that's from William, the CEO of Technology Management Incorporated, um, one of the um, advanced um, small companies that are developing fuel cell systems it is a leader globally, not just here uh, regionally. And um, we're going to use the talents and expertise of all of these speakers to chat a little bit about what policy and regulations can do to help or hinder clean technology, entrepreneurial uh, startups, early stage companies, mid-sized companies, even large companies. We're going to talk about how the private sector has really led the way to clean technologies, sustainable technologies in the private sector, contrasted with the early days of the environmental movement where government and academia led the way. So we hope that you'll find this very interesting. 
The only political thing I'll say, and these people are more than free to disavow anything I say, by the way, just so you know. Um, we've had plenty of, I'll say, predicate uh, for the political um, convention going on here in Cleveland, what Republicans may or may not need to do uh, with respect to sustainable business, clean technologies, and things like that. Um, but I think it's fair to say that our hypothesis of this panel is that um, the Republicans are not helping themselves by being the party of no. Ideas are necessary. We heard lots of ideas in the last panel. And those ideas need to be not only aired and debated, they need to be vetted by the private sector and semi-private sector folks that we have up here on this panel to see what works in the real world. Ohio, and Northern Ohio in particular, is a job-scarce region of the country. It has been for a long time. Uh, whether you attribute that to um, globalization, moving manufacturing and moving pollution to, to China, or to other places, frankly, the Midwest around the Great Lakes has had the equivalent of a Hurricane Katrina except that it transpired over 30 years instead of three days. And so our hypothesis is that clean technology, sustainable technologies, sustainable business practices, products and services can move this region forward in job creation and economic development. Um, I'm a partner in the largest law firm in the state that practices environmental and energy law and related litigation. But my civic job is to be the co-founder of the Corporate Sustainability Network, which has worked with the Business College of Cleveland State to have a peer learning forum of our large, medium, and small corporations so that they can teach each other how to profit, use the markets, create jobs, and at the same time, being sustainable socially, environmentally, and of course, economically. So, having said that, um, Jim, you're up. Let's let's hear about the Red Load Interceptor Project. It's always a uh, thrill to be the uh, from the last panel of the day. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious. How many of you are actually part of the convention for local disinterested local citizens? or just it was hot outside and came in to get out of the sun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you for being here. Uh, the Port of Cleveland is, is a government agency. Um, our government entity is a unique, statutorily crazy thing. And our, we're the only thing that's organized for them here to actually promote economic development. And we do that in a lot of ways, one of which is assisting in investments and brokering economic development projects. Another one, of course, is uh, shipping. Uh, we operate the Port of Cleveland. Uh, those of you that haven't been down to the waterfront recently should do that and see the level of activity that we have on you. And the third thing we do is promote maritime commerce uh, in, in, in Cleveland, uh, including the docks that aren't ours, but that go up the river to our industry partners that are uh, upstream. So I'm part of a good bit of my work is associated with sustainability. I want to just take a minute and see how do we approach sustainability and our, our approach on innovation. Um, one, I define, and, and we have the court, define sustainability based on a series of premises. One is, it's really based on nature's uh, natural tendency to self-assemble assets into more complex and more resilient systems. Uh, we have to understand how nature works <coughs> to understand how sustainability works. Uh, once you do that, then you also get a quick understanding that people and capital function exactly the same way. We tend to assemble from small, small units or the more complex units and capital does the same thing. The more, the more it assembles, the more resilient it becomes and the more productive it becomes. So a lot of our focus in terms of sustainability is not about light bulbs and, and um, uh, energy efficient windows. It's about growing the value of assets. So a lot of times that means redefining what's, what may be or have been perceived as a waste product or a problem and then trying to define it in, in, in the form of problem solving and asset growth. Uh, specifically, uh, what Dave was going to talk about, I'm happy to share, 
we have sediment management. We have a ship channel that the, the sediment naturally settles on that ship channel and has to be dredged every year to the tune of about 250,000 yards a year. Uh, the Corps of Engineers, federal government agency partner, uh, is supposed to dredge the channel, and their solution to the sediment has always been to throw it away uh, and try to define the cheapest, uh, most cost-effective, in their eyes, turn to how you throw stuff away. Uh, if you look at nature, the nature's processes, you understand that nature doesn't throw stuff away. It recycles it, it purposes it, reassembles it, and continues to reuse it, so it continues to have value in, in an e ecosystem setting. Uh, and, and also in an economic setting. So our approach is to really look at sediment and, and try to treat it as a commodity rather than a waste product. But one of my fun phrases is that every year, the Cuyahoga River delivers 250,000 cubic yards of inventory for our doorstep. But we have to learn how to harvest it and put it into the economic system. So we developed a couple of programs, uh, and they're fairly innovative. As I found that I was in Montreal last week at an international symposium on sediment management. Imagine being in a foreign country and half the people speak French and they're all talking about sediment. So maybe this is a global trend. Um, but actually, sediment settles the same way no matter where you are in the world. It's a product of physics and, and energy and how sediment, uh, how green size is set. So understanding that it's a universal uh, uh, commodity that works the same way no matter where you are, you can apply uh, aspects of water and energy uh, to management sediment. So we have a program we call this plain sheet sediment choreography, which is the dance with the physics, the dance with the water, the dance with the energy, and the sediment will sort itself and turn itself into a commodity. And so that's how we approach it. So one of those programs is out on our confined disposal facility that the Corps of Engineers built. And they say it's full, and we said, well, if you change how you harvest the sediment, you can harvest a, a good bit of market value out of what is delivered there. So we built a series of sluiceways and settling gates and stuff. We got some investment from the state of Ohio, and now we're able to uh, harvest and resell about half of the sediment that comes into the uh, our CDI and put it back in the marketplace. Uh, and that, that we think that's a fairly useful way because it makes the, the disposal area last twice as long. The core said it was full through our programs. We've got extended the life now to 47 years. So we think we, instead of having to go out and spend or find 150 to 200 million dollars for a new disposal facility, we can take the one we have, change how we use it, and make it last for 40 years. So we think that's an important uh, step forward. The other thing is about why dredge. Why do we let the sediment settle in the ship channel where it becomes costly and difficult and complicated to get rid of? It? So we also did some research, work with a patent uh, technology from Ohio and a private sector uh, partner of ours that's in the engine and soil business. And we have, have installed and operate now what is called a bed load interceptor. It, it's upriver of the ship channel a little bit, and the sediment goes right past the door, the inventory. Uh, the bed load interceptor will catch it as it goes by. Uh, the heavier, uh, higher value, of uh, course, materials, the sands and gravels, the, the, more, the, the more useful market value things. And we call it a hopper, we pump it out, run, run it through the dewatering system, and it, it's ready for marketplace. We work closely with the environmental community, uh, especially Ohio EPA, to make sure that what we were doing wouldn't hurt the river and also it isn't still polluted in some way, maybe problematic for us. Um, and, and by engaging the regulatory community, participating in innovation, they were pretty supportive of the whole process. We got, again, we got the state to invest in that process, uh, and we've been operating on that little interceptor now for just about a year, uh, and as we continue to be fine, it's very computerized, it's kind of senses the flow of the river and all that sort of thing. We think we can reduce dredging requirements by about 15 to 20 percent. Um, the cost of operating a bed load collector is a dollar a yard. The cost of dredging, placing it on the barge, taking it to a confined disposal facility, and unloading it there is $17 a yard. So there's substantial cost differential for those things that you can harvest without having to go through the complicated process. But it's new technology, it's a new approach, it took a lot of people willing to bet on, on innovation to make that go forward. And I will tell you too that the stuff that we harvest from that sells, it, it goes on the truck at six bucks a yard, so it's self-funding. 
pays its own way. And uh, it provides a, a new source of revenue and a new source of commodity for the local construction market and several other things. Uh, one, just as a, as a related systemic uh, effort that I'm going to take another minute on, some of our sediment um, it is also because we, we sort it and grade it as we go along. As it comes in, we, we're able to understand its engineering properties and make it available in certain markets. Uh, one of those markets is extremely important is is urban renewal. Um, part of that is sustainability is to grow the value of assets. When you have old houses and they're, they're demolished, they're demolished at all, they've been vacated because of the housing bubble and the change in demographics of the city of Cleveland, we end up with an inventory of close to 20,000 houses that are on the teardown list in, in, in Northeast Ohio, 10,000 over the next 10 years. Virtually all of those houses have a basement. When you tear the house down, what do you do with the empty basement? Um, so we're able to make our sediment available at a much, at a very favorable economic cost to the land bank, the regional land bank, and use the sediment at 200 yards per household, you know, per dwelling, it's torn down, uh, and also the basements of, of demolished houses. So that provides a, a, a reliable engineering product to fill the basement and to promote restoration of an urban neighborhood as it's going through transition from, from, from being uh, kind of a derelict area to a new, new, new thing. So we, we try to bring, if you will, a systemic, integrated approach to our problem solving. So a couple of takeaways for those, those people that aren't here just getting out of the hot sun. Um, we're small, we're agile, and we're very entrepreneurial in our, our approach. And so focusing policy development on asset growth, I think, is a far more, you should always measure a grade, I think, that are growing the value of our assets. And that includes both our, the, the typical assets that you have on your balance sheet, plus Human, human assets and city assets and natural, natural assets that we all depend on. Um, supporting innovation because everything we did has never been done before. We have the only debt that collector in the Great Lakes. Uh, and now we've got interest all over the world about how this thing can be very useful. So we think we can develop market opportunities for the inventors and, and, and producers of that technology. Um, and, and so being at the front end of that stuff, you shouldn't be afraid of innovation. Uh, we, we brought the state agencies in very closely with us during our research to move this thing forward. So building rapport with regulators so they're not, it's, they're not against everything, they can kind of help participate in problem solving is an important step. And then recruiting skilled private sector partners. You know, we recruited a company called Chris Crowers, a well-known regional uh, producer of engineering soils and recycled products and things like that. Uh, they understood the marketplace very well. They were able to move a lot of our commodity very closely with us into the market. So um, that was the approach that we took. So our approach on sustainability is, is really to take a problem and turn it into asset growth and then move those assets back into civic wellness and well-being. That's, that's what we approach. And we're, we're excited about the, the growing economic opportunities that we see for sediment management and what we're doing here in Cleveland. Thanks, Jim. That's a very exciting story. I'll have to give a legal disclaimer. I was uh, part of the legal team that helped part of these projects uh, take place from a contractual point of view. Um, but it's a great example of not only public-private partnerships and having a lot of private sector corporations involved with many levels of government, both from a policy and regulatory point of view, but it is a market-driven value proposition that makes the whole thing work. So. Um, what, what we'll do, Jim, is I think we'll go one by one since the case study is fresh in everybody's mind. Um, thank you for mentioning the, the, the policy and regulatory drivers that you identified. If you were king of the world, and I guess I'll ask each of the speakers to think about this for their own case study, if you were king of the world, what policy and regulatory opportunities or challenges um, were uncovered during this project? The uh, well, basic issue was uh, struggling with the core of engineers. Uh, agencies get formed, governments, Congress passes kind of overbroad for the enabling legislation to allow these agencies to do their work, and they try to create national solutions. Uh, and, and they get dug in, and they get more of them, if you will, on their red tape and their policies and procedures. So they were. Uh, uh, 
I want to infer that they were of no use to us in terms of trying to develop innovation and problem solving. They had their rules, they had their, their issues. Well, it's not the cheapest approach, therefore, we, we really think you, somebody else needs to pay the difference in the cost. Uh, they had never done bedlam no interception, they didn't really understand it very well, so they had nothing uh, nice to say about it. Uh, so, just, just federal agencies, if you talk in on their own history and their hubris after a while, becomes very uh, uh, frustrating. Some of you may know, uh, a couple of years ago, there was an issue in western Ohio, off of Toledo, where uh, there was a nutrient overdose from the agricultural industry that induced a big micro microcystis algae outbreak. Uh, the wind shifted and it blew all this uh, toxic algae towards the water intake in the city of Toledo. So for four days, they, they had to turn the water off, two and a half days, they had to turn the water off to, to 390,000 registered voters. So um, suddenly, uh, politicians that may have been supportive of, uh, let's say, the agricultural industry and the slow pace of, of, of land stewardship got very motivated, not like shutting people's drinking water off to get people excited. Um, and so the state of Ohio got very serious about Lake Erie and the water we drink and our relationship with it as a, a bunch of civic interests. And they passed and, and funded um, a series of initiatives that were very helpful to us. And so in one case, you had the federal government that would say, no, no, the sediment's fine, you can throw it in the lake. And the state of Ohio said, no, you're not going to put any of sediment in the lake. And you need to do better things with it. And by the way, for it, you know, there's here's some money to help solve the problem. So a real dichotomy of how, how the locals in the states were way more responsive in dealing with that thing than, the, let's say, the, the stuck in the mud federal agencies that are just happy to keep doing what they've always been doing. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, well, we're still on the topic of water. Um, and I apologize when we rehearsed this. Um, we had a certain order of speakers, and I want to change that completely. Um, just based on uh, the prior panels and the, how this panel is unfolding. Um, EP Host, um, Splash Link, Clean Water Lines. Let's stay on the topic of water. And why don't you talk about how, what your private sector solution is and how you interface uh, with policy and regulations and work with Clean Water Alliance. First of all, um, very excited to be here and very grateful to the American Sustainable Business Council for inviting us and having this really important discussion today. Um, just a little bit of background on, on water in general. We have a, a so very significant stress on our water resources and infrastructure, not just in the United States, but also globally. And this can represent some opportunities for innovation, but also some opportunities for growing business and enabling much more um, healthy market response based on what we have here in the United States and some of the lessons we've learned that can be exported to other parts of the world. When it comes to water here in Northeast Ohio, we have a very rich history. We have, uh, you know, what's often believed to be the birth of the Clean Water Act here. We had a river that caught fire. We also have a huge legacy of expertise that grew out of that uh, set of challenges you know, some 40 some odd years ago. And because of that, we also have an opportunity to reinvigorate the economy around key issues as we see increasing stress. We have huge population growth, we have a, a, you know, changes in our environment, and we have uh, with these increasing stresses, higher demand and impact as a result of some of these, these shifts. So if you think, for example, about um, uh, drought in California, we have a, a range of technologies when it comes to terms like water reuse that uh, really are, in essence, technologies that have been around for a very long time. We have a, um, one of the biggest challenges, though, is that we have a very fragmented marketplace for enabling response to these types of challenges. So one of the things that we do with, with Splashlink is we actually provide an online platform that enables the market to find one another dynamically, quickly, um, you know, based on the specific issues that, that a given player might be dealing with that's right in front of them today. 
So if we have a situation like we had in Toledo, the ability to find technology that uh, is somewhere in, in Denver, Colorado, or in Singapore can be critical to being able to respond to a challenge or a crisis. At the same time, we have a marketplace that has a very difficult time getting visibility to the players that need them. And that's something that we try to address and with our partnership with the, the Cleveland Water Alliance, we work with a whole range of stakeholders in the marketplace. They're a nonprofit, we, we are a for-profit, they provide some of the, um, uh, you know, bringing together of players in the marketplace to develop those relationships that are often so critical for doing business. We provide a tool for them to stay connected and to find and search for what types of solutions they need. So from a policy standpoint, um, what we tend to see are a couple of different things. You know, where, where Jim was talking about some of the challenges of, of um, policy and regulation at the federal level, we see a lot of young companies that are innovating new technologies, trying to bring them to market that actually run into a lot of challenges at the state and local level. And the reason for that is that uh, if you think about water, um, water is used for industry, for you know, generating our lights, for uh, you know, creating our clothes, um, oil and gas, and in communities, there's a lot of regulation. But what we tend to see is that regulations not only vary from state to state, so if you have a company that has been certified to provide a solution in the state of Ohio, that doesn't mean that they can necessarily provide a solution in the state of Pennsylvania or in California. Um, what we also tend to see is that these younger companies don't really have a lot of resource for piloting their solutions. So in such a regulated industry and a very highly fragmented industry, we tend to see young companies that may have some financial support for the research side of things. It tends to be a different kind of uh, financial support when they get to um, you know, a certain level of revenue. But in between, there's just not a lot of, um, I think, visibility or recognition that there needs to be some uh, partnership with, with other companies that are more mature as well as, as some support from the policy level to help these companies get pilots in place and, and improve their technologies and demonstrations. Great. Any specific, um, I'll guess, even if you want to uh, not use names to protect the innocent, any specific experiences you have with FlashLink that show that either opportunities or challenges from public policy or regulation that you can share with you? Um, well, I would say, you know, when you think about water, there's actually a whole range of sub-sectors in there. So um, our particular company, we deal with trying to connect the players in the industry, whether they're dealing with uh, industrial water or, you know, public utility water, whether it's storm water, wastewater, um, drinking water, and uh, you know, one of the things that I think has been um, uh, interesting to see is that whenever there's a big crisis, um, like we saw with West Virginia, like we saw with Flint, like we saw in Toledo, that tends to exacerbate some of that um, uh, you know policy regulatory type of, of response, and not necessarily. You know, be taken on as a, you know to provide continuity in how those solutions can get out to market to actually address the issues. So, you know, when you when you think about something with a, um, uh, like there was a, a contamination in West Virginia a couple of years ago, and um, again, I just invite you to think about like how how do these problems actually get addressed? You know, you have. You're talking um, about the spill in Charleston and the Canal River right. from the uh, chemical plant nearby. Exactly. So you have a, you know, water inherently does not have boundaries. The water flows, it goes past one city and moves to another city. 
um, different people have accountability. You know, once it hits their certain boundaries, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a, you know, kind of a, again, a continuity with who has accountability and how these solutions need to be addressed at different points. So, you know, when you have something that, um, uh, if you have a contamination, for example, there's, of course, the interface of the public-private sector that needs to occur. Um, the public sector needs to make it uh, accessible for the private sector to respond and collaborate on some of these solutions. But then you also have additional things that are impacted. So, and, and solutions as well that can, that can um, take a lot of different shapes. Stormwater is something where you know you not only have pipes to direct water, but you have you know the, the gullies alongside roads. These are all things that can help prevent some significant flooding. At the same time, you don't necessarily have to send water all the way through a pipe to a treatment plant to get that water clean and return back to the source. You can use things that are that are in the ground, a lot of the green infrastructure that um, we tend to hear about with this. With this particular group is probably more familiar than most. Okay, thanks so much, Evie. Um, we're actually not going to go straight down the road, Kathy, if that's all right. If you were to skip over to Barr. Um, and what I'd like to do is uh, we have gone from, you, know, you can draw your own conclusions on, on Jim and Evie's uh, takeaways, but I think it would be logical. Bar, for you to talk about what's happening in the Youngstown, Mahoney County, extreme Northeast Ohio region, what you're doing to uh, create sustainable jobs, not just environmental clean jobs, but to make your region sustainable uh, economically, socially, and environmentally. Well, thank you. Um, I'm from the Youngstown Business Incubator, and for most people, if you know Youngstown at all, you are expecting to hear a very negative story of closed steel mills and um, urban blight. And there's still a place for that. Um, it's part of our history, and unfortunately, it's still part of our present. Um, but we are certainly a very different city today than we were even five years ago, let alone 20 or 25 years ago. Um, the city of Youngstown has, has, for about the last 20 years, really been slowly rebuilding itself, and the Youngstown Business Incubator has been a large part of that process. Um, last year, we were recognized as the number one university affiliated incubator in the world. Um, and then this year, we were recognized as the number one in North America. We fell slightly. Um, it was stacked against us, but um, we are very proud of our tradition of innovation and entrepreneurship. And that is largely a result of the support that we've received from both the federal government and the state government um, in order to build our incubation program. We're partnered with the Jumpstart Entrepreneurial Network. To my left. Um, it's a tremendous state funded program to support innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and we have received numerous grants from both the state and the federal government um, to build our campus. We are now in the, pro in the process of renovating our fifth building. Um, we will have about 175,000 square feet of fully, of, well, we're eventually fully occupied. We're currently fully occupied at 110,000 square feet. We'll be at that 175 when this project is completed. And our goal is to fill that, that building with additive manufacturing companies, with the printing companies, which is our focus now. Um, it fits into this discussion because we are rebuilding an urban core, bringing sustainable jobs, high paying jobs, back to communities that have been decimated. Um, it's far more cost effective to rebuild and sustain our urban cores than it is to continue to build infrastructure out into the suburbs, uh, running water lines and sewer lines and, and building intersections and extending our infrastructure rather than reinvesting in our four cities. And so when we liken this, uh, our, 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 our success and the, um, uh, the work that is taken, of, of course it's been expensive. We've, we've had to, to, to rehab and um, reclaim hundreds of thousands of square feet of, of old buildings that had environmental contamination. It would have been much cheaper for us to go out to the suburbs, to build a building, and um, create our program there. But it wouldn't have done anything for the city of Youngstown. It wouldn't be contributing to the, the reuse and reintegration of that community. And um, in the long term, it would have been more costly, because it is always, always more costly to extend lands out 
and extend your infrastructure out over the life of the program, over the life of the project, than it is to, to make badly needed reinvestments that are not um, So as, as we look at sustainable policies and at, at government action, of course everything will be reinvested. There's no doubt about that. But if we, if we create policies that disinvest in our urban forests, we will be costing ourselves far more money in the long term. Thanks, Barb. One um, question. The Youngstown Business Incubator has been very successful, but it's also at least partially funded by state and federal grants. Um, some extreme wings of uh, the Republican Party would say, well, if it doesn't work in the market, then it should fail. And, and um, how do you address that kind of argument? And Kathy, of course, you really need to address it, and Benson, you too. I would say, the youngest of us is able to just simply what exists in the market. We wouldn't sustain ourselves in the market. We would, we would not be in existence were it not for at least some level of government funding in order to allow us to exist. Um, that's often true for airports. It's generally true for most forms of public infrastructure. We're not a, we're not a government agency. We are a profit. Um, but we do very good work in our community, and we have a very strong, positive tax uh, return for our investment on our local tax base. Um, we have about 300 jobs currently on our campus um, that, that generate um, an average salary of $60,000 per person, and they're paying taxes, um, purchasing homes, buying cars in our community. That by far goes back in the, the very modest investments that are, are made by the government when we keep us operating. We are working every day to develop programs to decrease our, our independence on, on all levels of external funding, and that includes philanthropy. Because if you look at our long-term sustainability, um, as, as difficult as this may be to believe, um, government funding is far more secure than philanthropic dollars at this point. Philanthropic dollars are getting tighter and tighter. Um, foundations become more and more focused on specific areas. Um, the things that keep me up are not, at night are, are, are not the loss of our government funding, but of, of grant programs that we've traditionally partnered with that suddenly become solely interested in children's issues or, or animals who are not puppies and kittens, we say it all the time. So um, certainly people who make those arguments, um, good things happen with public dollars and we need to acknowledge that there are some good programs and there are some bad programs and reward those that are succeeding. Thanks, Barbara. I'm going to uh, turn to your tag team partner, Kathy Bell. In addition to being a very talented CEO of Jumpstart, I have to say that um, we share some common ground, both having received advanced degrees from Duke University, but her undergraduate institution is Davidson College. And she's a LeBron James fan, but she also um, cheers for a certain player from the Warriors. Right. So uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll forgive her that, and uh, Kathy, share your wisdom for us, please. <laughs> thank you. I had the best of both worlds about um, the guys are um, So thank you for the chance to be here today. I represent an organization called Jumpstart. We are a nonprofit organization. We work to unlock the full potential of diverse and ambitious entrepreneurs. And we do so to economically transform entire communities. That really means job growth. The Job Growth Initiative, and we're doing that by helping entrepreneurs to be as successful as they can be. We do that by providing capital. We are an investor, and we also provide technical assistance to support those entrepreneurs. And in that, we work very closely with Barb and a number of other partners in the community. So we do work as a network to make sure that this assistance is efficient and delivered um, with impact. And one of the things I think that's been important in providing that assistance is we hire private sector people to do this. So these are former entrepreneurs, people who have done it before, who know how to do it. That's been a critical piece of this. It's one example of how the private sector is absolutely critical to something that could be considered economic development or maybe not a private sector activity. Um, 
the uh, success of the work that we have done, and I say we, this is sort of a collective we, the success of the work that we've done has been documented by lots of different organizations. Uh, Cleveland State just finished a report and issued it last week, which identified that of the thousands of companies who we have worked with and our partners have worked with and who have grown over the years, just in the year 2015, they contributed $1.4 billion of economic impact to the state of Ohio. And we know from the tracking that we get from those companies that they've led to the creation of more than 10,000 jobs. So um, what we've noticed is that when you help entrepreneurs to be successful, they are successful. And we're really excited about that. Another thing that's really been critical to our model is that we are a public-private partnership. And this gets to our perspective on um, what is the role of policy, what can the role of government be, which is uh, we have been extensively funded by Ohio Third Frontier. We write grants and compete for funds from those grants. And the program's been set up as a matching program. The state funds are um, allocated if there is a matching dollar, sometimes more than one dollar, that is matching from the private sector. And that's been really important because the metrics of success for our program are private capital dollars that these companies raise and revenues that they generate. So what these uh, independent reports show is essentially that those government dollars that are provided to us, which are provided then as investment dollars or as assistance to the companies, have been returned back at over 50 to 1. So that seed capital that has come from that source has been in recognition of the opportunity and the job creation and then the economic impact that those companies can, can then create at that ratio, more than 50 to 1. So to answer, I guess, one of your questions, which is, you know, what can be the role of policy in the work that we do? We really believe that when uh, policy provides incentives for the private sector to address market gaps, that that can create significant benefit for both the private sector and the public sector. And we're kind of an example of how that model has worked uh, in this state. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, last but not least, of course, is Benson Lee. And in addition to my earlier introduction of Benson, um, as I'm listening to the rest of the group and thinking about what Benson has done uh, in the fuel cell world um, over the last, what, almost 25 years, um, it's, it's really fascinating. One, uh, Benson's company has a fuel cell system that is on the very edge of commercialization. And uh, to those of you who are familiar with the uh, entrepreneur cycle or innovation cycle, um, he's in what we call the valley of death, going from friends, family, angel investment, public investment, to early stage private capital and it's a hard transition for every business to make. And that is sort of where the partnership between public policy and the private sector, the market, and regulation can really make a difference uh, for good or for bad in terms of uh, incentivizing uh, and promoting strategic industries uh, for this country. Um, and, and I think Benson needs to tell a story, but he's got a fuel cell system that appeals both to potential national defense um, uh, procurement um, officials and producers, as well as a fuel cell system which can transform uh, the developing world and providing electricity in places which has no grid infrastructure. So Benson, uh, I set the bar high. I'm sure you can meet it. David, I think you should add that you were neither an investor nor a funder in TMI. Correct. I'm going to hire you. Correct. Um, I'm a silver tongue devil lawyer and I can't be here for an hourly rate that's exorbitant. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to end up with what they commented on, but I'll start there. We are in the Valley of Death, and before uh, the uh, session started, I commented that the role of the government would be to identify those of us that are in the valley of death, but it's a long journey. And the, the best analogy I can think of is uh, companies like ours could use help the same way a parent would put their child on a two-wheeler with training wheels and get them going 
But once they're off and running, the parent doesn't need to be there and the confidence, not just for the, the uh, child, but for the people that are watching that child, the parent's not gonna sit there and get apoplectic that they're gonna fall over. That's the stage that we're at, and that's a role that the government could play. Help us get through the valley of death instead of just assuming the private sector will step up and put money into us. You may ask, well, how come we haven't received the private sector dollars? And this is where I was going to begin my, my little uh, uh, introduction. I am an entrepreneur. I'm a, I'm a, uh, as David would say, a recovering corporate product development person. But uh, I found my calling in being an uh, entrepreneur. But not just an entrepreneur, one that took on what are called disruptive technologies. Uh, a disruptive technology, by my definition, is one for which there are no measurable customer demands. We don't count early adopters. We don't count innovators. We look for the real market. A disruptive technology does not have that yet. Think of the first airplane, or the first car, or the first engine. Think of whether or not you would have invested in an airline just because the Wright brothers said, we can make this thing work. It doesn't exist. And so we have three strikes against us. One, we're a small business. Number two, we're in the technology business. And number three, we're in the disruptive sector. Another way to underscore what disruptive is, is uh, there's a story about people asking Henry Ford what type of market research he would have done. And he said, I didn't do any. I went with my gut. If I had asked my prospective customers what they wanted, they would have said, faster horses. And I think that sums up where those of us that are in the disruptive sector are. To the point that Dave made, the great industries of this country, of this world, started with disruptive technologies. And that's the opportunity, that's the upside opportunity that we see. So I have a mysterious black box called a fuel cell that we think can be a game changer. We think it can be the tipping point for what is now emerging as the distri dis distributed generation industry, which includes wind and solar and other types of small distributed power. But none of them provide continuous power, which is what is needed for economic development and sustaining quality of life. Uh, wind and solar recharging batteries don't cut it. They're a great start, but they don't cut it. And the tipping point for this industry, DG, is something that produces continuous non-stop power. That's what a fuel cell can do. So that's a worldwide global opportunity. But here in the state of Ohio, we have a, uh, an organization that's been formed where those of us in the fuel cell sector have come together. And what we have discovered is that it is a manufactured product. And if you take the panels off of a fuel cell, the pieces and parts are all the things that are made in the so-called rust belt, and particularly in Ohio. So Ohio, as part of the distributed generation sector, really has an opportunity to start a new industry because of all the supply chain companies that we have, the work ethic that we have, which, thank you to Detroit and the automotive industry, we know how to make things by the millions, on time, on budget, and supply the world. And that's a workforce. They may be out pumping gas or farming right now. That is a culture that we have in this area. So those of us that are basically homegrown see this as being a huge opportunity. The fuel cell has gotten sort of a bum rap uh, for a lot of good reasons. And so we as a company have tried to differentiate ourselves from all other fuel cells. And one of the things that we've done is we've taken the opportunity to not just look at chasing down markets where you have natural gas. One of the things that we've developed is the ability to run on all kinds of fuels wherever power is needed. So we run on liquid fuels as well as on gaseous fuels. We are not a hydrogen fuel cell. We are a fuel cell that can run on liquid, gas, fossil, and if it's a biofuel, a renewable biofuel, and Jim, if you can harvest the algae and plants along with your sediment, I bet we can turn it into clean electricity. And then we can put it in EV's database so that they know we have a solution. And then we'll get a jump started YBI to fund some things. There are a lot of connections that could be made very easily. 
but we run on different kinds of fuels. And the market that we saw as being the biggest opportunity, not just for ourselves, but for all emerging clean energy, was to service one third of the people on this planet who do not have access to clean electricity. And so we have that as a market. We have a lot of solutions. We can provide clean, continuous power to uh, homes and businesses where they were in areas where the grid is poor or non-existent. Uh, we've looked at medical clinics. There's a great deal of foundation dollars pouring into uh, different parts of the world for humanitarian, for uh, refugees, uh, or to conquer AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, what they need are home bases. Think of them as clinics which can operate non-stop and where they have lights and clean water. Fuel cells can, can sterilize water. 30 minutes from here in Highland Heights, we have a system running where we're using the heat to sterilize water and power a refrigerator. These have been going for five months. So, and I could go on without... I'm going to move to the day. Um, uh, just a couple of points. I think that the... Uh, the the role of the government would be to first step back and recognize what a disruptive technology is. Uh, we have been very fortunate in our funding over the years. We've been funded by Army, Navy, Air Force, Department of Energy, the EPA, by NASA, by the Department of Commerce. Uh, we've been very fortunate. But when we are given the opportunity to sit down with government, uh, 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 I'm not going to use the word, uh, let's call them people that are working on the government public policies. Uh, there seems to be this feeling that either you're in R&D or you're commercially available. And there's nothing in between, but that's where we are. We are not in R&D. We've talked to uh, the State Department, USAID, the World Bank, the IFC, and none of them acknowledge, they all say we need clean power, clean energy for many of us the areas that we work, but it has to be commercially available. That closes out a huge number of companies like us that are out of R&D. And so if I were to make a change that you asked came for the day, I would say any dollars that are out there, please just put the problem out and let us solve them our way. Don't tell me how to solve the problem. At least in the fuel cell area, that is the dilemma we have. Every time an RFP comes out, they're telling us what kind of fuel cells to use and what type of solutions they want to see. It just doesn't work. I'll stop. Thanks, Benson. And I know we're running out of time, Richard. We have time for Q&A at all? Let me take one question. Okay. Let's, let's do this. Let's, um, is there one question out there that somebody's dying to answer? Man. Can I call you Congressman? Congresswoman Ann? Okay, thank you. A former elected. Oh, wait, for one grand. Yeah. Benson, too. Um, uh, Benson, I'm going to ask a, oh, sorry. I'm going to ask a, and I don't mean this to be an impertinent question in any way, um, but it seems as though there's, there is a, heck of a lot of money sloshing around right now looking for good investment. So how have things gone on seeking private sector investment? And I apologize if I missed something that you said. Let me make a broad statement that both answers your question, which is directed at my company, but it's a broad one. Um, people that make investments basically use models, financial analysis models, that they have used and are very comfortable with. The first question that someone usually asks, where I know we're not going to connect, is who are the customers? That's business 101. Disruptive technologies do not have a measurable customer demand. I can give long lists. If you don't have a customer, they can't put their analysis tools to work to estimate how long it will take for me to get to that market and penetrate it at what rate. Therefore, they cannot figure out what the return on investment. I thought about this problem after running into it over and over and over again, and I came up with an answer. The large amounts of money that you're referring to 
which may be in the hundreds of billions of dollars, are almost all borrowed money. So we try not to meet with people who are managing other people's money because we know that to get that money, they committed to these time, money, formulae, and models that have been successful. That means that if you're dealing with something where you cannot identify the customers, you go after permanent capital. This is money that you are investing your money, and you're doing it because you have the patience and the belief that this is worth investing. I hope that answers your question. Well, that's in part. And the reason I ask the question is because I, I did have this experience in the district that I served. Um, with uh, it, it, some, and, and I'm not in any way damning your uh, technology or your work, so please take that as a given. Uh, the, the, the business that approached me um, and had approached every other uh, public servant in the area of either party uh, purported, and this, uh, the proprietor did not have your background to but purported, but was well established global recycling and, and waste hauling business, purported to be building an incinerator that would convert bio fuel, bio waste into gas, hydrogen gas. And the, the relevant point here is that they were seeking a hundred anywhere from between a hundred and two hundred million taxpayer guaranteed loans from the Department of Energy. And this company had received support from Senator Chuck Schumer, I'm sure Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, all the, you know, the, the local Congress people, uh, again, either side of the aisle, the you know, local county executives, and you know, you name it, Republicans. And they've gotten support from everyone because what this prior said was, this is clean energy and it's jobs. And then they asked to sit down with me and my staff thought, well, this is gonna be a slam dunk. You know, this is a you know, piece of cake. Of course you're gonna sit down with Jim Taylor and say, oh, thumbs up, Jim. It's a clean energy and it's jobs. And he, I, I very politely asked him a series of questions that you would ask, that any of us would ask, sensible people would ask about his business, his business model, uh, the science of this uh, project, et cetera, et cetera. And it became very clear to me uh, that this project was invalid in every conceivable way, including scientifically. Now, to DOE's credit, they did not, to date, provide taxpayer funds to uh, provide loan guarantees, but what worried me about it was the inherent corruption of having all these public officials uh, from either side of the aisle seeking, this guy made direct political threats to me in front of other people because it was obvious I wasn't going to endorse this project, and in fact it became a powerful enemy of mine and funded my opponent. Um, but it, it, was, it was remarkable to me that the, the potential for corruption of the process of conferring public funds, and again, that it, I'm not saying the public funds shouldn't fund your work. Please make a mistake about that. But it, it, it is, it does pose potential problems um, when we uh, have public mechanisms that can be inherently politicized. So I'm just respectfully submitting that. I had direct experience with that. So Ann, I'd love to see you at Cleveland State the second Friday of every month when we have our business corporate roundtable talk about sustainable products, one of the things we talk about is the problems of crony capitalism. One of the things we also work on things to build Vogel Song and Pablo Guevara and Victoria Avi in the back, who uh, have founded the Conscious Capitalism Chapter of Northeast Ohio, is, yeah, capitalism, that's right. Uh, how, you know, these kinds of businesses and these champions here at the table can help save capitalism from itself. And perhaps... Save government from corruption. And, yeah, save government from corruption is what Ian said. And, and I guess as I, as I filter these comments, one of the premises that we've all worked from is that properly understood public policy and public investment can drive private sector investment and growth. Um, and so it's, Benson's analogy is perfect. The, uh, the child that's taken off the training wheels, the parent pushes him down the driveway and once he learns to balance, he's on his own. And, 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 and there's Katrina work. Katrina, I loved your comments about the old clean area, 1990. Well, 
Before that, 1970 and 1977, Clean Water Act 1972, we find not only government policy, but government regulations stifling these kind of new technologies that the private sector are trying to grow because they're old models. We, this thing works in large part because we have folks from the private sector. And what's the difference with the private sector? Accountability in ways that, you know, politics is inherently uh, somewhat less scientific, as we all know. That would be distinctly less scientific. That's one of the frustrations. In, you know, the private sector people actually know how to get something done because they have deliverables they have to be responsible for every day. Uh, the responsibility in politics is attenuated. Yes, it's election cycle to election cycle, but there's a heck of a lot of tomfoolery that can go on in between, as we all know, and that's what we're suffering from today. Respect this bit. So, Dave, so Dave and Nan, I know this is yep. a, a conversation that we could very well continue, but I'm, I want to be respectful of Yeah, we're getting into the Rod and Jerry uh, back so, and forth a little bit. No, no, it's, yeah. it's good. It's good. Well, but could I, could I ask um, Dave if we just wrap it there because we have Lee Fisher, yeah. you know, interim dean, Let's, waiting. And, and we, I guess we, Benson, we want to give you an opportunity to quickly, 30 seconds, respond to this. Uh, the first thing is, by the way, anyone that wants propaganda on our fuel cell, I have some up here, and there's some at the registration desk. Wendy, or ask Wendy with the green uh, print dress. Uh, my question is to Nan. Nan, you have an MD degree, which tells me you're one of the few people that understands science when you were in Congress. How many people in Congress have either engineering or science backgrounds, would you estimate? Very few. Very few. Not, the, not the figures you spoke with. Very few, and none of the figures you spoke with as entrepreneur had ever, and clearly it had a science background. But the problem is, as we all know, these are the people who are empowered to make laws and make decisions. And that's very, very worrying. And is that mirrored in the number of public policy consultants, that they are not engineers or scientists at all? Oh, that's it, absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, it, and, and it's, uh, well, you know, politics is a completely different answer. But in one of my arguments always is, of course, that you know that's when we seek this balance. I mean, that's why we're here in essence. But you know, because we we have to empower people like you, people who are scientists, people who have a sincere knowledge of, of what we need to do and how we need to do it. All of you here at this table are doing practical, smart things that deserve support. So we don't want a government that siphons away resources wastefully because they've got a or buddy who's going to fund them politically. Uh, or just, you know, they're making bad decisions, and it's rampant in government. So yeah, that's why we have to reset the balance. So Dave, can we? Yeah. We to thank so thank you to all members. members. Summary. So, um, you know, the goal here for the American Single Business Council owners and strange bedfellows together uh, to have these conversations. And, uh, you know, as it was said earlier in the day, our premise is that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And we think it's a much better idea for business people to be at the table trying to influence the policy making community. And, you know, some of these issues that we've just been grappling with are, are quite complex. Um, you know, government is, is clearly uh, not the solution to all of our problems. At the same time, you know, the private sector can sometimes act in a certain way where it produces externalities that the rest of us pick up. So, you know, what we're looking to do is really foster this conversation um, with you as business leaders and as civic leaders and academic institutions. So, if you're interested in continuing that conversation, we're very happy 
to, to do that with you. Um, so let me just quickly introduce Lee Fisher. Lee has a esteemed and storied background. Uh, he was uh, Ohio's Attorney General. He was the Lieutenant Governor under Governor Strickland. Uh, he's now the Interim Dean here at the Law School. And Lee, we're really you know, very grateful for the use of the space here today. And just uh, thank you and happy to hear what you have to say. Thank you. First, I have to correct you, Richard, on behalf of all former lieutenant governors of the United States. We don't serve under governors, we serve with them. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I want to say uh, thank you to all of you, especially those of you who have stayed, because I know that the room was much more crowded when we began uh, earlier today with Congresswoman Hayworth and uh, with Richard and with Rob Sisson. So it's very nice of you to be persistent, and that's consistent with the concept of sustainability. So thank you very much for being sustaining audience members. Uh, I also uh, want to especially thank the American Sustainable Business Council and Richard. I want to thank uh, our uh, esteemed uh, law professor, Alan Weinstein, who's up there. Alan is uh, a rare uh, professor who holds uh, basically professorships not only here at the law school, but at the Levin College of Urban Affairs. So Alan's at the intersection of all these issues that of the Ohio Third Frontier Commission, uh, which funded uh, not only Jumpstart, but a number of other uh, companies. And Congresswoman Hayworth, I would say to you that one of the great attributes of the Ohio Third Frontier program is that we have a rigorous vetting process that is scientific, uh, that often involves the National Science Foundation, so that even when there may be political influence used, and usually there isn't, but when it is, it's more than balanced by the scientific work that we do in vetting all proposals. Uh, I also want to say a special thanks to the most recent panel because I either know or know of every single one of them, to Jim and to Benson and to Kathy and to E.B. and to Bart and to Dave, uh, and especially uh, longtime friends of Benson and Kathy. Thank you for uh, the fact that you probably each could have spoken a half hour longer and it would have been worthwhile, so thanks for being brief. And thank you to all of you for being at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Uh, we think we're one of the great law schools in the country, not just for our quality, but for the fact that uh, we are a unique, uh, iconic institution in this city because many of our graduates are the first ever to graduate in their family, uh, either from college or law school, of which we're very proud. Uh, for those of you who are going to the Republican Convention, have a great evening. For those of you who are from Cleveland, we're especially proud uh, to host all of you. Uh, we're a great city, and I think you're seeing that firsthand having been in our town. Thank you very much.